Hi and welcome, Michael Berris is my name. I'm the Director of Investment Services here at OpenCorp and welcome to July's webinar on the Property Investing X Factor. The X Factor, I've got our guest this month, Michael Matusik. Uh, Michael, we're not gonna make you sing, so you can sit oh, there and Oh, I could sing relax. if you want me to. I know no you probably would, but <laughs> we'll spare our viewers and, and get to the heart of what Michael is really good at, and that is understanding data and demography. Uh, he is an independent housing market analyst. Uh, he's been a specialist in running Matusik Investment uh, Property Insights, I should say, uh, since 1998. And I'm sure a lot of you that do follow him will be familiar with the, uh, the Matusik Missive. Uh, the must read, as he considers it, as <laughs> I consider it, and uh, no better time to be talking about it because one of his posts on social is in the top five viewed posts, I think, of the week. Uh, anyway, he knows what he's talking about. We've got some great insights to be, uh, to be talking about with you this month. While those of you that have been seeing our regular webinars will know that we love to have guests on and seek their expertise and insights, we've been talking to a range of chief economists over previous months. Michael's a little bit different. He understands the demographics, the people movements, what's influencing the housing market from more than just a data perspective. So we've got some, uh, some fresh insights and uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Michael, welcome. Thank you very much. And you know, me, me training on social media is as close to as I get to celebrity these days. So um, anyway, and I could sing, but we might do that later on. Well, uh, you're, uh, you're welcome to if you want. If it's gonna trend on social media and put us top No, 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 there, we actually wanna, we wanna give your, your audience some, some good information, so we won't sing. No, no worries at all. Well, let's, uh, let's start with one of the, the most, I guess, common uh, commonly talked about topics out there, and that is, you know, housing booms and, and, and troughs, which your post was about. Uh, I know as an investor, it's very easy to get kind of six months into a major growth mm. cycle and think that has the boom run its course? How long is it going to last for? Uh, what are your views on, on the current boom and have we reached the end of it? Okay, so we haven't reached the end of it yet. Um, let me just break this down into a couple of sec two segments. One, we'll talk about short-term market, yep. which is somewhat easy to monitor if you know what to look at, which we'll talk about. And then there's a longer-term trend, um, and those longer-term trends seem to repeat. So if you look at the short-term, um, housing finance and an annual change in the amount of housing finance is a best lead indicator to what's going to happen in property values somewhere in the near future, usually with a six to 12-month um, delay. So what's happening at the moment is the amount of housing finance is growing quite rapidly. That means people are actually applying for loans and getting loans, um, and that needs to find a place. So they've done it to buy something. And it's increasing somewhere in the vicinity of about 50%. Normally that translates to something like a, if you look at history, and, and it's got a very strong um, causation rather than correlation. A lot of charts actually have a correlation, but we want to see something that causes the, the price growth. That would indicate that prices for the year ending, say, to September will increase across Australia somewhere about 20 to 25%. So we're about halfway through that increase. So I expect somewhere in the latter part of this year to see prices keep on growing and somewhere in that 8 to 10% mark. Now, the latest figures will come out for housing finance the latter part of this month. It'll probably see a slackening off of growth, and that probably means that the market's still going to grow, but it's starting to slow down. I suspect it won't slow down until we see APRA tighten the screws or we see the Reserve Bank increase interest rates, which I think will happen sooner than they actually have been saying. And in fact, yesterday, um, they were saying that they're going to start looking at how much easing and how easy it's going to be in terms of the future. So they're, they're look, talking already that everybody, there's going to be some form of interest rate change upwards, not tomorrow, not the next day, and not like X percent, um, but slight, slight tapping of the brakes. Um, so there's still price growth to go, I believe. Um, the market will slow down in its rate of growth, but it's, and it's probably got another 12 to 24 months in it before it actually goes to um, the peak of the market and then slows down. Now, taking the longer view of that second part we talked about, um, and one of the charts that we've got in, in, on the screen is that it actually shows a 140 years of, of price changes in Australia, um, which let me tell you is, wasn't easy to do, but I've updated <laughs> it for this, for this podcast. Um, and in real terms, so it, in 2021 dollars, it shows what's happened in prices. And the key thing here is that there is t periods after a strong price growth, and the recent price growth we've seen is pretty strong, you see a plateauing of values. 
There might be the small four, but if, you, if you're an investor and you're taking a longer term view, 10 plus year type view on your purchases, then, then that's more important than the smart light changes. And so I suspect after this boom, we're going to see a somewhat long plateau in the, the present values that are set. Um, that seems to have happened in the past. Um, and the reason I say that it's a long-term um, plateau is because there's not much really, other than population growth, which drives new housing demand, there isn't really much in the tank to drive prices until wages and everything gets settled down, and that might take a long time. So that's good news, because a lot of people think that after this, this, this run in the market, we're going to see values come down. Um, my analysis uh, would suggest that unless we see China implode or we see war or something major, we see a, um, a GFC times two in terms of its impact, um, have put, putting those things aside, which are really, I know COVID was a black swan, but they're, they're, they're more predictable black swans. Um, and I think unlikely at this stage, we're likely to see a plateauing of, of values, which again is a good thing for investors. Yep, it's a really good point. We, we talk at OpenCorp a lot about investing for the long term. Obviously, that's prudent with property. We talk about mitigating risk, you know, looking at what are the drivers and, and the ways that you protect yourself. Clearly, it's having property that appeals to the right kind of demographic in the area that you are. So that even when the market is, um, is stagnating, as we call it, or plateau, as you call it, um, there's that cash flow consistently coming in yep. and there's rent growing over time. So the investment is still working from that perspective because as we know, markets cycle, right? Don't they? They go through a growth period, then a plateau, then another growth period like you're talking about. They don't go up in a linear fashion consistently. So I think that's really important for everyone to understand is that you have windows of time and this has been my, invest my experience in my investing journey over nearly 20 years that when you can get in and at the right time in the market, you tend to make the majority of the growth in a relatively mm -hmm. short period, but you're holding for the long term, knowing that that cycle will come around again. So given that you're a fan of the, uh, the property clock, yes. uh, as everyone is, um, is familiar with, uh, where do you, can you maybe give us a, a, a snapshot? We focus on the four main capital cities here, but uh, feel free to expand where you see uh, the main capital okay. cities and regions on okay. the property clock right now and why. One of the things I do with the property clock, and in fact, if you Google my name, often property clock will come up as the Matusic property clock. And in fact, the clock that that's part of this um, podcast is um, something that I've described a certain way, and I'll just quickly run through that. So there's, there's four stages in, in this clock. There's a recovery, um, there's an upturn, there's a downturn, and well, I've called it a plateau for the chart, but we call it also stagnation. And there's a peak and a trough, obviously. Um, and let's make this very simple. So it, it is like um, spring, summer, autumn, winter. So the temperatures are right now. They're not equidistant in time like the seasons are. Um, the recovery and upturn are shorter periods of time. The downturn can be a bit longer. And often a market sits in stagnation for some time. Now, a lot of people, when you should really be buying property and accumulating property, that's when everybody tells you you shouldn't. And that's when the downturn or stagnation. So that period for many markets has passed. Um, so we're seeing, say Melbourne, what we believe is at the trough of the market. So you're likely to see as, as the city gets out of COVID um, and starts to recover certain things about it. Now, we will do that because, you know, you don't become the best place in the world to live and then become not the best place, you know, like, okay, you've dropped down the rankings, that makes sense, but you just don't, you just don't disappear. So in due course, Melbourne will go through its improving cycle. It already is improving in terms of established properties um, and the new market's actually likely to in continue improving for some time. Ahead of that is places like Sydney, Melbourne, Melbourne and Perth. Um, they're in the, the recovery or beginning of the upswing cycle. That's why they've still got price growth in them. So buying property in those markets, particularly buying well and buying quality property is still a good thing to do. Um, from an investment perspective because you've got some growth left to happen. And that growth could be substantial. As I said, it could be 10 plus percent um, before it reaches a peak. Um, and then certain markets are above that and they'll peak earlier than that. But as you can see on the clock, a lot of markets are in between the recovery and slight upturn phase in Australia. Now that's not, the clock can be reset 
at times. And so what happened with, with the property clock, it was a lot of those markets were actually in a, in a downturn phase before COVID. But because of the incentives that happened with COVID, not only home builder, but job keeper and so forth, um, some of these markets have then been accelerated through a, um, a stagnation period that they normally would have exceeded. They would have rested a year or two ago at those price points until things accumulated again. So that's why I think as well, it's the first part of this conversation that when we get to that peak, they will rest for longer because you can't keep on growing like mm. this. You know, there has to be a time we have to slow down. Yep. Uh, and so I think that the really important point there is that uh, unlike a clock, a certain location or city doesn't work its its way around, you know, not, kind of start to finish in a circle. It's it's timing at any point in time, which is which is important to understand. And and secondly, uh, the main takeaway there, which I couldn't agree more with, uh, you know, be greedy when people are fearful and fearful when people are greedy. Uh, you don't make money by buying at the at the peak. And that's what we see a lot and what we try to help all of our viewers understand is that buying counter cyclically is where you really get the benefit. You know, the, uh, if we take the Sydney market back in 2017, it was at the top of nearly 90% price growth. Uh, a lot of investors speculating and trying to get rich quick. That prompted the APRA and the regulations to tighten up. And only in April this year has the median house price in Sydney exceeded where it was in, in early 2017. So if you're kind of following the heat and following the hype, you've, you've pretty much seen nothing over four years, where if you're buying counter cyclically in the markets that are yet to grow, mm the foundations and, and fundamentals are a lot stronger. And one of the things of property clock is, is, and where you are in the clock really comes down, if you boil it down, it's just supply and demand. Yeah. So where the demand is high and the supply is tight, now that's two things. One can be an existing market. So the stock listed for sale versus the number of people who are interested, not only just in auction clearances, but generally interested. And you can get a gauge on that by going to many of the portals and say how many people are visiting that property or those suburbs and so forth and get a gauge from that. Um, and then in the new market, it's the underlying demand, the need to build, which is the population growth conversion to um, need to build housing and the amount of supply that's in the market. And that's one thing that's facing all major markets in Australia is there is a limit in the supply. It looks like there's lots of supply um, and some people, the town planning fraternities will say there are. And I'm a town planner, so I'll get away with saying this. The plan, town planning fraternities say there is, but when the practicalities of delivering that stock on the market at affordable price point in the right areas that actually have got, you know, education and work and those things either coming or already there supporting that is very hard and very tight. And that's another thing that's keeping the values likely to plateau at a high rate is that is the supply lines, um, particularly for new development, are getting tighter. Yeah, supply and demand was something I wanted to get your opinion on. Obviously, you've talked to the, the supply side. Uh, while our Australia's borders are closed, effectively, uh, apart from some some expat re Australians returning, what's your view? You know, medium to long term in terms of the, the overseas migration coming back. Um, I've seen some of your graphs recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got our opinions on that. I'm, I'm keen on, on what yours okay. are and why. The Treasury's made a, a, a forecast, Treasury Department. It's a bit interesting that in Australia, the Treasury Department, um, the Federal Treasury actually controls the population policy. It should actually be a wider think tank that sets that, but it's economics, okay? So that's the key point there. So there's, there's forecasts to show that next year or two, or the latter part of this calendar year and into next year, we'll still see um, less people turning up. In fact, there'll be a loss in migration from overseas. Um, that might happen. It depends on, on vaccinations and, and, and for, um, quarantine facilities and those type of things. I, sus I think that those forecasts are a bit dire and I think it'll happen faster. And I do think when they open up the borders, they will open up the borders higher than the previous high migration rate. I don't necessarily agree with that as, as, as a policy. I think there needs to be some middle ground um, because, you know, we're making the cities denser and, and we could argue less livable. But to support an industry that's important to Australia being construction, it employs up to 30 percent of the workforce. Um, they'll need either more incentives, which I don't think are going to come in terms of home builder and things like that. They will need to actually have a higher population growth. Um, there's also talk about taxes and a whole range of things, which is maybe not to talk about today. Um, so I think that you're going to see a high level of overseas migration come. 
somewhere in the um, instead of the 190 to 200 odd thousand per year, um, it's going to be you know 250 to 300 thousand for a period of time until we can actually start to see um, the industry particularly being supported, and we can also see helping in terms of a tax base grow. So. The economy is driven by three things. It's more bums on seats, what I like to call it. So that's population growth. It's debt, which we've, we've probably taken a little bit too much on, particularly the COVID um, excess and, and support, and it's productivity. So that's one of the three ingredients. So in summary, I think you're going to see a high level of overseas migration come, which increases to the demand. Yep. Yeah, we agree. Um, no doubt the government's got a revenue challenge with all the stimulus that they've provided so, yeah, and, and need nice. to grow that, that income tax revenue base. So let's talk about um, maybe not income tax, but what, what creates that in terms of jobs. Um, and specifically, I guess, uh, what do you see moving forward as the factors that could influence uh, employment um, and specifically employment growth? Uh, and what does that mean for investors? Okay. Two things I, I think are important here. One is wage growth. We hear a lot about wage growth and how there's going to be a return to wage growth. Um, and and um, the Reserve Bank is talking about, you know, well, inflation comes and it won't come until we see wage growth of X percent. Um, unless it is union forced, I don't believe there's going to be major wage growth in Australia. Uh, again, a, a, one of the charts I have is, shows that the wage growth has been been growing, but at a, at a declining rate. Um, and that's because of a lot of things that the world faces today, the algorithm, digitalization, the internet of things, robotics, um, and so forth. So a lot of the things that, that it, working from home, you know, so you, we're in an office now, which is nearly empty. Um, and yes, you rotate the staff and everything else. Um, but, you know, a lot of those people are, work from home and then, you know, a lot of them will face a cheaper price point elsewhere. Um, and it'll be competitive in terms of the cost to delivery. Um, so those type of trends. So that's one thing. So I don't think there'll be a lot of wage growth, which we'll pack over here for a second and talk about. The other thing is that where the jobs are likely to be, um, and there's a fair bit of evidence for this, and there's good forecasts, which I use on a regular basis, and I check them, and they're five-year forecasts to outline where the jobs are likely to be in the future. And a lot of those looking forward to service-related jobs. So if you think people who work in retail, they work in tourism, they um, they work, unfortunately, as nurses or people who are um, supporting health, or they actually work in education. Sadly, teachers aren't paid enough neither. Mm. They're lower paying jobs. And that's supposed to be about 50% in the next five years. I'd like longer forecasts, but I at least can trust these five year forecasts of the amount of um, job growth. And that means that two things, there'll be more renters. And I think the census will show that. Um, there'll be an increase in renters. There's been a steady increase, um, but there could be 35 to 40 percent of Australians in the current sense next month. Shows that people are renting, and I think that will continue to grow because they can't afford, or their lifestyle and work doesn't get them in a secure location where it makes sense to do that. Very much what happens in America and Europe um, and other Western countries. So there'll be more renters, and then there'll be more people per property or title because they need to make ends meet. So there'll be not one person or one family renting or one couple renting a house or, or whatever it is, there'll be several. Mm -hmm. um, and that will also come into ownership where the boomerang child, um, maybe not only boomerang or boomerang, but then stays in their teens and if not in their 20s and even 30s these days, and then parents, grandparents and their, um, their grandkids and the middle fan, the squeeze sandwich in between living in the same house. And that's sometimes just, excuse me, to make ends weak. Um, and so the lack of wage growth also supports that. So moving forward, um, it's important to buy a quality property that's well designed that allows you to have where necessary and often as a strategy, more than one tenant. Mm -hmm. Yep. And in addition to more than one tenant, how important is an affordable price point, given what you're talking about with regards to relatively lower income paid jobs as the, the trend moving forward? Oh, I think it's important. So what we're seeing to, to, to make that happen, particularly in the house and land new spaces that you're seeing lot sizes contract mm -hmm. because it's a rate per square metre um, that's going up. And that reflects 
some of people think as developer greed, it, 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 it is, well, it's part of it. No, it's, uh, it's, um, it's largely driven by planning and infrastructure charges, like up to 40 to sometimes 50%, depending on what state and territory you're in, of the cost of providing that land is actually taxes and charges, right. and that has to be passed on. So the land sizes are contracting. Now, that's just not, oh, we're going to squeeze them in sardine city. That reflects a lot of people's lifestyle too, because if they're working three jobs or four jobs, um, and then they're wanting to come home and maintain a yard and those type of things, that's not happening. And in good estates, well, that's the yard's given away because there's quality open space within that estate. Um, and there's bicycle paths and there's means in which you can get out and use the facilities. It's not like the traditional street in a, in a middle ring suburb where, okay, the park's down the road, but it's a you know, it's not well lit and it's, you know, who's in that park and the, the kids who use it have to cross five streets and, you know, some of it's dangerous and all the rest of it. Um, it's more um, passive surveillance and those type of things in those newer states. And then the, des and then the design of the, ha the house, the house price per se, whilst it's gone up to deliver the house, particularly in materials of recent um, six months to 12 months because of COVID and shortages and the thing we're having with China, um, fracas we're having with China. Um, where we, you're seeing that not really escalate that much. So that, that's the product of the house that hasn't gone up. So affordable property on a smaller, often increasingly on a smaller block size um, is a key thing. I think the other thing is you better buy quality rather than, than, than bigger, a, a massive house. I think that if it's designed so it's got a lot of wear and tear and that the internals are so that, say, two couples could share. And so the bathrooms are separate. They've got separate bedrooms. I'll, of course, have a shared kitchen and all those type of things. And the acoustics and quality of that build is such that they can they can cohabitate is quite important. Right. Um, how does uh, the way we live and the desire for lifestyle and all of those kind of things, um, how does that influence kind of the property market given, I just think about, you know, uh, my parents met early 20s married mid to late 20s, kids, you know, et cetera. Um, Nothing wrong with that. That's all right. No. <laughs> all good. Uh, but it's, it's just very different to the, I mean, everyone knows the smashed avocado stories, yeah. right? But the, 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 the greater emphasis on this kind of more transient lifestyle and move for work. Um, one of my brothers lived in America and people were born here and went to college here and work here and here and here, as you were saying. Uh, how does that kind of changing trend influence I think there's a move to more property. what we'll call portfolio work. So instead of people working for um, your parents, no, probably work for you, both of them or you, probably your father, work for one place um, for most of his life. Um, it may, or one profession most of his life and change firms. Um, and that was, I mean, I've run my own business for 20-odd you know, years, but I worked for other places in the same field um, for about 15-plus years before I started my own thing. So I've worked in the same field. A lot of people don't do that these days, particularly younger people. They might have a, a, a core skill. The guy can use camera equipment and record and everything else, but he might actually work for himself part of the time, work for um, a commission basis for somebody else, might find that, you know, um, by accident that he was filming athletic thing and that really is is where the money is at the moment so he's moved to that field and does something there but then comes back to do corporate stuff so the whole range of things that are, that are varying in work and technology allows that to happen um, and and COVID I think will accelerate that because it's broken some nexus between home and work I don't think it's as strong as some of the talking heads say I think it'll pull back to a degree but it's, it is there and if you're entrepreneurial and stuff it's it's now a good example is that two years ago, I had explained to people what Zoom was. Right. I'd explained to my clients what Zoom was because I didn't want to go to the city for one meeting and come all the way back. I'd say, no, no, could we Zoom it? Now it runs off their tongue. Like, you know, oh, no, I don't need, let's Zoom that. Like, you know, we don't need to meet. So much so that I'll say, can you do a job cheaper um, and not visit the site? And I say, no, I've got to inspect the site as physical property. You know, it's, it's real estate, you know. So it's interesting how it's changed. So the portfolio works there. So people aren't anchored so much into the one location, which is a challenge for home ownership as we move forward. Um, I think there'll be more renters, but then it challenges, I think, somewhere along the line about, well, what is home ownership? Do they, do they, is there a transferable 
right? Is there a, is there a, do they own the land? Do they own the building? Can they move the building like they do in the States? We're not talking just caravan parks, but then they actually move that to an, another location if need be. I think we're in this next decade or so, particularly when land supply is tight and there's an issue about, we can't all afford this increasing price. What do we do about ownership and transfer of title and moving and so forth? One of the things that built around, I think is going to be a big thing here and not just in towers. But in in the in the in the what I call the flat market as well, so the land, house land package market, where you know, well, we can live there because all those tenants want is security of tenure. They want to know that they've got something for a period of time. They'll lock themselves into a rent increase, which is actually quite good. It's four to five percent. The work that we've done will show that um, for built, for that guaranteed occupation. But they might not. They might say that they're going to stay there for three years plus an option of two more. But they might have to break that like a commercial lease and. They can trade that to go to somewhere else and trade that back and forth. Right. And that's, just, frankly, I, the, the simplicity, that's an app that does that of some description. Right. So I think we're going to see that transition. Um, I also believe in this space you're going to see um, people compromise their housing more than their parents would. In other words, um, they want a good space and a quality space, um, but it doesn't have to be a real big space. Um, because they, you know, we all touch our phones and everything else. They're not, well, I notice they're getting a little bit bigger than they used to be, but we can all work like this. Mm. We can all work in a small place. We're used to, to sharing a space. Um, our, our, our office is the coffee shop, COVID aside, but it's our office is coffee yeah. shop. Um, our meetings are in restaurants and those other places. Um, so anchoring a development and an investment, I think it's important that works close by but it's also got amenity and quality of life experience that's outside of the immediate abode. So well-designed, it could be small things, well-designed streetscape in their subdivision, good park provision, good walking tracks, mature trees, um, um, and then close to f facilities like this. They don't have to be in the city. That's yeah. another thing. People try and buy, I've got to buy closest to the CBD that I can. Actually, if you analyse price growth correctly, and you strip out the renovation activity that's happened in some of those locations, like inner city and middle ring, you'll find that they aren't necessarily winners in real price growth. They're spread out um, throughout a city and they're focused on what I call pulse points. So this type of uh, development, and this type of office support with restaurant and so forth that you're in, your, your office is situated is, is, might not seem like it now, but will become a pulse point. So this is where people go. They won't, whilst it's not that far, they won't, they'll go to Melbourne on occasions and if they don't work there and they work here, they'll do that maybe once or twice or three times a year. So this becomes the pulse point and then you'll see values and things rise. So that's where you're buying and where you've got your, your provision of stock is often around one of those pulse points. That, that, that's one of our key criteria is, is proximity to jobs. And, uh, you know, we've had the conversation with, with multiple clients. They said, oh, you know, this might be 35, it might be 40 kilometres from the city, wherever. How can it see the growth that it's had? It's like, well, within a half hour commute, you've got over 400,000 jobs. Hmm. So understanding, I guess, those, uh, you know, the principal activity centres or pulse points, as you call them, is a really key part. Um, that's another thing I was going to ask you, I guess, around the, the, the town planning aspect of your expertise. How, how do you see governments uh, provisioning for all of that? So you've mentioned that lifestyle and amenity factors close to home with smaller land sizes because of planning challenges is really important. Uh, you've talked about the fact that you think net overseas migration is going to be up mm -hmm. on even... Uh, historically high numbers that we've seen in the last 10 years or so uh, as well, to be able to accommodate that population growth with the challenges that you've talked about, uh, how's the government going to roll out the, the proximity to work in these pulse points? What does their strategy look like? How do they do that in, okay. the, in the years and decades to come? The answer to that is they don't have one. Right. Um, that's, and that's, that's a sad thing, but it's an opportunity for the investor, is the buyer as well. Um, so I used to say when I practiced town planning, um, when I worked for a range of councils before I did property analysis and so forth, and that was by accident that happened, um, but it was a good accident for me anyway, um, is that town planning is usually a decade or two behind the times. And it's a, it's a reactive, the interestingly thing, it's not an advanced thing, it's reacts. Um, 
And so they should be implementing in planning, they should be implementing um, a lot more um, upfront in developments, the need to provide the community facilities early in the piece. Now, some councils are actually quite keen to do that, South East Queensland, particularly there's a couple of councils that want to say in the new development, we need you to provide, we'd like you to provide this earlier than later. Now, whether or not it's a cafe and a, and a park that the kids can play with and some open space early, um, and then anchored with some form of non residential use. Now, it doesn't mean an office tower. It can be space that forms a meeting area and things like that so people can facilitate work there. That couples with good Wi-Fi and all those type of things. So there's some thinking like that. But overall, they should be allowing a lot more housing types, the missing middle, if you want to call it. And that can apply in in, in, in a, an outlying area. There's the demographics still want that out there. Yeah. Um, maybe not to the same degree, but they still want that out there. So they should be providing a lot more mix in housing, which they seem to be reluctant to do. Um, the market wants it. The building industry will provide it. Um, it's the regulatory situation that stops it. Um, the other thing as well, and um, somewhat controversial, but you know, we sh I believe we shouldn't be spending money chasing white elephants like the Olympics. We should actually be spending money on, on our money on better infrastructure. So uh, Brisbane's market are quite well. You know, it would be better to build a dozen bridges in Brisbane. Right. Um, half of them vehicle access and the other half green bridges to actually make the city function better, um, access to work and everything else. Then they'd, and yeah, okay, go for the Olympics. Don't build anything else. Just leave, just you make it work with what you've got and spend whatever money you were going to spend on new stadiums and all those type of things on improving infrastructure. Um, and those things that matter, which is, which is often small commutes day to day. Because hmm. another thing where I've done the work I've done um, would suggest that people don't all travel to the city. It's only a small proportion. They're, they're daily and important commutes are what I call the chicken scratch. They're all over the place. And so that kind of says you don't have to buy downtown. You need to buy in those locations, in and around where those chicken scratches are happening. One of the things that's also important in terms of the provision of values and is something that is better controlled from the from a government government's point of view is where schools are right. and the school zones. Um, the opportunity for investors, if you do your homework and you look forward to where growth's likely to be, you can, you can, you can I don't like to say pick winners, but you can pick winners. Um, I grew up in Winston Hills in, in Sydney. Um, when I, we lived there, for the older people watching this um, podcast, country practice was actually filmed just around the corner. You could see the lights. There you go. Today, the block of land that my parents bought was a thousand square metres to put a house on it. That has now townhouses on it. Uh, it's been knocked down and so forth. So, you know, in 30 odd years, well, a bit, a bit more than that, 35 years, that's gone from, you know, rural setting and, and you know, a popular TV show of horses and all that stuff being filmed just, just around the corner to now being, well, essentially middle ring um, Sydney. And that's likely to happen in many of the markets where you, you have, have development. You're going to see them gentrify and change and increase in demand. And um, you just got to have a long-term outlook. Awesome. It's, uh, it's great. It's, it's, it's a lot of the, the same kind of things that we talk to our clients about is, is trying to picture and vision what it's going to be like down the track. And you're coming in early. Now, early doesn't necessarily feel like early if the market's grown for the, the 12 months prior, but uh, it's, a really, it's a really good point you raise. Uh, one last thing I want to, want to ask you about, Michael, you mentioned that, uh, I guess, planning and government strategy is more reactive than proactive. Uh, is that because it's all focused around votes? Yes. Right. Uh, and well, it's, 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 it's politics, not policy. So right. a lot of things that happened in, there used to be a time when the Deputy Prime Minister, um, Brian Howe, was the Minister of Housing federally. And that's when we had better cities money. And so what happened in inner Brisbane and large parts of Sydney and also Melbourne was those dock lands and all those type of things actually got converted. And what stopped them was the sewage and water supply was so bad, they didn't know what was under there. Because it was, you know, it would come from the 1880s and nine, early 1900s. And, you know, it was, well, we used to have a dirt track and then we put some sewer pipe in there and we covered it up and we got, we, the capacity is zero. Um, in fact, it's, it was over, it was overutilized. So that town planning foresight, um, when the deputy prime minister was actually in charge of housing, drove that type of that type of policies, not politics. Um, and then what's happened in, in from the late 80s um, 
into now. And the key thing was there was something called the, there's a reason why there was something called the Hilmer reforms, um, which the Howe government wanted to actually introduce GST. It needed to do, make some changes. Um, and what happened with the Hilmer reforms is they found out that local government, instead of being a, a cost and a debt centre could actually raise revenue. So that actually, instead of saying, oh, well, we'll, we'll lay the roads and the sewerage and everything because then everybody will contribute to it. No, developers can actually contribute to that and they can pay more money. So it changed the structure of how money was raised out of development and then it became politics, not a policy. So first home buyers, grant, and all those type of things became an election issue rather than thinking through saying, what should we do to get more people to own their house in Australia, what would be the best thing to do? It wasn't to say to everybody, oh, there's a 14,000 grant and most real estate agents increased their listings by 14 to $21,000 um, that very same week. And I'm related to a real estate agent in Ipswich in Brisbane um, who did that across all their properties and got that price across all of them. Right. So, you know, it just inflated the market. So um, yes, in short, it's politics. Right. And so, uh, less politics and more kind of government strategy, I guess. Uh, you mentioned around government stimulus throughout the conversation. Uh, there's been a lot of it, obviously, with uh, with COVID. You mentioned Home Builder that had the desired effect and some oh, from everything that we read around uh, construction activity, which has been great. Do you think the government stimulus tap has, uh, has been turned off? Do you think there's more to come and, and what might influence that? I think that there is um, not much in the tank. Um, $300 billion, uh, I read last night, was about the estimate for the COVID largesse. Mm -hmm. uh, one could, you could argue it was worth it or not, but it, that's um, here or there it's been spent. Um, but I think it, we've got an election, um, federal election. I think it'll be this year, not next year, but that again is an opinion rather than anything else. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Morrison's on a man shake, so he's taking some form of diet. So I just wonder if that happens. You know, it speaks more than than, than anything that's uttered in Parliament. Um, so we might have an election sooner than later. Um, and I do think there could be some incentives for first home buyers, um, and maybe matched against what each state is doing in terms of a new build, um, and maybe a, a cap. You know, ten thousand around Australia. That will be politics again rather than policy. But that's. I'm not saying wait for it because it might not happen. But I would not be surprised that you know, under the under cover of of shortage of of. of uh, supply and that some markets are very tight when it comes to rental supply and getting those renters into buying a property and then getting people to build those properties for them. We'll see that type of a policy announcement a month or two before an election. Um, and for most people in those markets who are looking to buy, that won't be a bad thing. Wonderful. Look, uh, thanks very much for joining us today, no Michael. Some fantastic insights as always. Uh, you heard about some of the changing trends that we're seeing in the, uh, the property market in Australia, some of those influencing factors and what to be aware of. Uh, but fundamentally, as Michael said, it comes down to supply and demand. And uh, supply is constrained, demand is going to be growing. And we've seen that not only through price growth already as, as part of this cycle, but also vacancy rates dropping dramatically. Uh, especially in, uh, in some of the major capital cities, even more so than others. But rental supply is tight. It's a great time for investors. That is the Open Court Property Investing X Factor interview with Michael Matusik. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've been through the process on the property selection. Now, if all of this sounds great, but you haven't got the time nor the inclination to do it yourself, uh, we've got a property investment powerhouse within our business of over 50 staff that are helping our clients understand and execute this strategy on a daily basis. So we can do it all for you. Uh, well, we can't do it all for you. The two things that you have to bring to the table are the money and the motivation. Uh, we, we, can't, uh, we can't do that for you, but we can do everything else. So in terms of what our service looks like at a higher level, and my team can break this down for you one-on-one -on -one in a lot more depth and share detail around this. Firstly is around uh, the education upfront. Today, has been a really, hopefully, useful insight for you around the process that we apply and why. There's a lot more detail that goes into it, uh, but the education process doesn't stop. So, you know, we have our annual family days that are about a bit of fun. We have our annual client nights, uh, consistent reviews and check-ins, 
to ensure that you're understanding how your property portfolio is performing yeah. around the goals that you want to achieve and that you're adding to your portfolio when you can. Yeah. We help you with all of that ongoing. So the education doesn't stop today. Investment property selection is clearly a massive part of getting uh, investment, investing in property right. And our research and analytics team are applying the MAP process and these criteria to identify the locations around the countries using the MAP process to ensure that we're getting it right every time for ourselves and our clients. One of the most common things that we hear is people are comfortable using equity that yep. they've created. Uh, they've worked really hard to get their own home. Yep. They don't want to put it at risk. Yep. Yeah. So we'll help you understand exactly how to structure the finance the right way. The way that banks want it structured and the way that we need it structured as smart investors are almost polar opposites. It's not complex. It's very easy when you understand how to do it. Don't worry about making the mistakes. We've all made them personally before now. That's why we teach you the best way to do it. We'll keep your own home separate, but be able to leverage the equity to grow an investment portfolio. The last thing anyone wants to be doing at two o'clock in the morning is getting up to fix a block toilet. We have property management in house and they will manage all of the ongoing tenant relationships once the property is leased. Uh, communicate with you around the key things that are happening, but they're basically backed by a large team to ensure that uh, the investments are hassle free and that everything is managed for you. Some of the best money you'll ever spend, it's tax deductible. Uh, there is increasing amounts of legislation that you need to be aware of. Uh, use a qualified and expert property manager. They'll, uh, they'll make it easy and stress-free for you. We do that as well. But most importantly, you've probably gathered from what we've been presenting that one property is not gonna make you wealthy. Don't get me wrong, one property is gonna be much better than the pension, okay? So you've gotta take that first step. Once you've taken that first step, you'll realize it's like riding a bike. It's not nearly as daunting as what you might think. And to be able to build a successful portfolio though, you need to be able to add to that portfolio a few times over the long term. Don't worry, you don't need 100 properties like Steve McKnight said back in the day. Uh, you need the right kind of properties focused on the right kind of things and costing you very little out of your pocket. You just need to be giving it time and not chasing get rich quick. That's the most important thing. To ensure that you can hold the properties over time and you understand how they're performing and tracking towards your goals, that's where you get the Open Corp Mentor for Life program. All of that hand-holding, that guidance, uh, being a sounding board, being that mentor. You know, I've got, uh, I think of clients of mine, Claire and James, some of the most nervous clients that have ever started out on this journey with us uh, back in 2012. Claire used to ring me on a daily basis saying she'd read this in the paper and it was freaking her out and could I explain it to her? She still calls me. The calls are just much shorter and much less frequent than what they were, but they've got five investments plus their own home. They've set their family up and that's phenomenal. So that's what we're here to provide is that hand holding, that guidance, that mentor for life to make sure, as cliched as long-term relationships sound, that we're with you every step of the way from when you start, you bring the money and the motivation, we'll deliver the end result and make sure that you're tracking towards the goals that you want to achieve. Uh, we're very proud of our track record. As Cam said, use the MAP process, whether you use us or not, please use the MAP process because it works. Uh, the way that we know that it works apart from our own portfolio, is that we had to make a submission to ASIC a couple of years back as part of our AFSL. Uh, when we look at the performance that our clients' portfolios had achieved compared to the Australian capital city average performance, we were 37% above uh, that performance on a per annum basis each year for the last 10 years. So we're very proud of that. Uh, but again, you know, we want to be helping our clients build a portfolio that's only going to be happening if the service is good and if the performance is there and people are making money. One of the things that I'm most proud of looking after the whole client experience within OpenCorp is the fact that since we started, half of our business has been repeat and referral each year. So that's the accountability that our clients keep on us is to make sure that those things are happening. Uh, you mentioned that there are a number of different teams there that yep. play a, a role in this. Uh, you're not dealing with six or eight different people we have single points of contact and a relationship management model in your investment management and in your property management where you deal with a single person. Those teams are just there feeding them the information. So you have really close relationships with a very small number of people. Yeah. You've just got the powerhouse of the wider team there to help you get the result. Beautiful. So hopefully you found today beneficial. 
the very first step is for us to be able to sit down with you and look at your individual situation because everything we've shared today is general in nature. That's the only way that we can do it with, a, uh, with an audience of over a thousand. So the first step is to sit down for your personalised individual strategy session uh, where one of my team will sit down and work through what your current situation looks like. My, far more importantly, where you want to be and uh, share with you and build on some of the investment property fundamentals that we've talked about today. Talk in more detail around the MAP process and give you a full outline of what our service offering is, including what we haven't been able to talk today around risk protections and inclusions that we offer as part of our fee for service to, uh, to ensure that you can just uh, put your head on the pillow at night, know that you're risk protected and know that we're prepared to back our experience. So there we have it, July's webinar on the property investing X factor. I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for joining us so far. We're not done yet. We've got Q&A coming up. Uh, I'm going to get Abby's help to, uh, to read those out. Thanks to everyone that sent in questions ahead of time and during, the, uh, during the, the, the webinar. We possibly can't get to every single one of those during Q&A, uh, but we're going to get the ones that we get uh, most often, the most common ones, the things that you want to know. Uh, so stick around. We've got Q&A coming up right now. Abby, over to you. Thanks, Michael. Um, we've got a question here from Tony who would like to know, what are the demographic reasons behind why tourist destinations are growing in popularity? We have a demographer. Let's ask him. Well, <laughs> this is where I can say that this is my opinion and not advice, okay? I'm not a financial <laughs> advisor. No, a lot of the, a lot of the, thing, a lot of the areas that, are, that have been in the tourist location, um, the demographics are driven by two things. One is the desire to live in that location. So people are very simple. So if they've been to a place, Harvey Bay, let's call it that, and they like the experience, um, and that could be a small thing or a, or a whole encompassing thing, they might have seen the whale at the right time and, wow, this is for us. Or they might have really enjoyed it and, and for a range of reasons. And often when there is the price is right um, or the um, it's close to where their family is, so Harvey Bay can get back to Brisbane and those type of things with an easy commute, they'll buy in that location. So that's one of the drivers is that the location was a tourist experience that they actually said, we could live here and it's less hassle and we enjoy living in being in this space, so why don't we move here? Another reason, which is a more darker reason, but I find it to be somewhat true, in fact, largely true, is that what I describe as poverty is nicer and warmer place. Those people actually live there because they can afford to live there. They can't afford or continue where they are, so they opt for a cheaper price point, and that's the driver. So it's a combination of both. One of it's a desirable location to be, and sometimes it's just simply because it's cheaper. Um, I think the key thing for an investor looking at those areas needs to understand that the depth of those markets are very small. And so if you had to come to sell, you are selling to a market that's only this big, whereas you buy in a major place that's growing, the market is this big and getting bigger. So you've got more buyers that are looking at your property rather than a market that's very thin. It's all good when it's happening positively, but when it gets tough, you've only got a small volume to sell to. Yep. The other thing that, uh, that came out of COVID data uh, that was interesting to me is of the 17 odd million people that live in the capital cities in Australia, it was only 5,000 more of them move to regional areas last year than the years prior. So there's always been a move for the reasons that you talk about out of capital cities to regional areas. Most of the overseas migrations come into the capital cities that's replacing them. Uh, but that uh, it makes a nice news story with a nice headline, but that, that shift to regional areas is not as pronounced yeah. uh, as, as what it might sound. Yeah, and the yeah. other thing with that, that regional shift from the COVID thing was that the ABS defines a capital city by its 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 statistical boundary, but it exclude what's considered a region for argument's sake is the Gold Coast or Sunshine Coast, or or um, is uh, Newcastle or Wollongong or Katoomba, or is Geelong or Ballarat. Now you could argue that if you live in Geelong, it, well, what you can commit to 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 um, Melbourne. So they 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 kind of like got some figures that are incorrect. I don't think anywhere near 5,000 people move to the true regions. The other thing that's in that figure is that, that any movement is a net figure. It's, it's leave, leaving and, and people leaving and people arriving. So a lot of people in the regional town, 
just didn't go to Melbourne, Sydney, Perth, Brisbane like they normally would for jobs and experience yeah. and, and escape the parents um, from the regional mindset. Um, but they've actually stayed put for the time being. So there has been a regional shift, but I don't think it's anything like the front page news would suggest. Yeah, good point. Thanks very much, guys. So we've got another question here from Andy, um, who would like to know, do you predict any changes in lending in the coming months? Well, crystal ball. Um, I do think APRA will actually tighten things before the Reserve Bank. Um, I think that they will probably wait till after a federal election against politics before they tighten the screws, but I think there will be some screw tightening. The bank's already doing it in some thing. They're already extending um, the longer term rates, increasing a little bit. Um, if I talk to loan brokers, um, some will say that it's pretty easy, but others, will, a lot more, will say that it's getting harder um, and the hoops are uh, 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 increasing in number. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, so it's hard to know exactly when, but I think it'll, the, most of that will happen post an election. I think the election will be in November, but you know, if it's not, it will be in March or something like next year. So it's not that far away. Anything you want to add? Oh, I just uh, that you know, we've in terms of indicators, we've seen New Zealand make changes to LVRs and and various things to to restrict uh, loan volumes. Um, uh, I think it's important to 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 remember that while we've got record low interest rates, banks aren't in a free for all lending situation. There are still sufficient buffers that get put in, put in place. The hoops that have to be jumped through are significant. Uh, just because house prices are at record highs doesn't mean the banks have just been pouring money out there willy-nilly and, and those people that have, have qualified for the loans can't afford it uh, and can't afford it on higher interest rates than what we've got today. So I think it's important to keep everything in perspective. But from an action-taking point of view, uh, I just look back to 2017. We had a number of clients that were saying, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm thinking about it, you know, 2016. Uh, by the time 2017 it came around, the buffers and the, the APRA regulations had meant that they were sitting on the bench and they hadn't been able to get in until you know maybe in the last 12 months, 12 to 18 months. So uh, if you've got the ability to get the borrowing capacity, don't wait, act now. Bank doesn't make you repay it if the rules change. Um, take that's advantage of the, uh, the that's, lending situation right now. That's a good point. I situation think a right lot now. of people, if, when, they, when they're thinking about it, get their ducks in line quickly and early. Don't say, oh, I found the property and then try and go about doing it. You should know what you could buy and 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 the terms of which you can get the money well, way in advance before you actually say, oh, I want to buy that. You know, that comes like we can afford that. We've got everything that's done. We'd, we, that suits us in conversation with you guys. Yeah. Great response. Um, we have a question here from Liana who would like to know what is the ideal property mix to consider when building a property portfolio? Right, you can answer that. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm the strategy guy. So look, with regards to uh, what we do and what I've done personally, Liana, uh, I'm a big believer in grandma's spaghetti, spaghetti bolognese. You've got the recipe, don't mess with it, just repeat it. Uh, it's super boring, it's not so interesting, uh, but it's super effective because once you identify uh, like Michael was just saying on the previous question, step number one is to understand your borrowing capacity. Uh, after you do that and you couple that with what you want to achieve, an investment portfolio is only there to deliver the end outcome that you want. And my end outcome might be different to Michael's and different to yours. So it's important to understand what you want your uh, investment portfolio to achieve for you and then execute that in line with the investments that you source. So uh, if you've found the right kind of investment that's going to deliver towards and contribute towards achieving those goals, do more of the same. Uh, it's very Australian to you know, do a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this. Um, find what works, lather, rinse, repeat. Thanks very much for that response. Um, we've got a question here from Brody who would like to know, how do you capture growth in a highly competitive market? That's a good question, Brody. Uh, what I would say is understand the dynamics that are happening. Um, depending on the type of property that you're looking at, uh, remove as much of the competition as possible, uh, acting as early as possible. And what you need to be able to give you that confidence is, as we were saying before, be prepared. Uh, don't find the property and then wonder how you're going to finance it afterwards. Uh, the better prepared you are, 
Uh, the six P's, prior prepar preparation prevents piss poor performance. Be prepared, know your boundaries, know your guidelines, then you can act with confidence and move quickly. I'm going to be a little glib, you know, as obviously I am a little bit. Um, you should have bought six to 12 months ago. No. Um, I think that it's key. And it's like, you know, I'm at the age, you're nearly at the age, I'm at the age and a grey hair and no hair and all the rest of it, that I've been around a while. Now, if you stick to what you really want to achieve and, and don't waver from that, you can get through that, that competitive rising market by saying, I want to buy X for X reason, four bedroom house in this location that accommodates a range of um, potential tenant profiles in that property and I can only spend, or I'm only prepared to spend 600,000, say, um, for that deliverable, then that's what you stick to, rather than getting caught by, oh, that one's this and I saw that, just stick to that. Um, you might have, you might lose a few um, because it's sold before you're, you can get there or a slightly higher price and you're prepared to pay, just stick to the nitty. Great. Um, we have a question here from Shannon who would like to know, with the upcoming census, um, what will be the key pieces of data that are relevant for investors to consider? Well, hopefully it won't crash this time like it did last time. <laughs> where, right every, where everybody in the first hour went like this and the whole thing went bang. I forgot that. There's only so much capacity. Um, you want me to start? Yeah, you, you, you're, you're, yeah. Okay, I think that. that first of all, you'll find there'll be an increase in the number of people who rent. That's been happening over time. The last census showed that it was probably about 30 to 35% across Australia who, who rent. Um, there's been studies done between the last census in 2019, sorry, 2016 to the next one, next month, um, that show that there's an increase in the um, number of people renting. I wouldn't be surprised if it's 35 plus. Um, this time around. The second thing is I think you'll find that a lot more people live in a, in a multi-generational share household arrangement than they did before. Um, the third thing is that the capital cities, um, I think, have been unrepresented, um, poorly represented in the total confines of the capital city as they now work. So, you know, Sydney really works out to, to, to Newcastle and down to right. Wollongong and out to... to um, Katoomba and the other capital cities are wider than the statistical boundary. I think you'll find those when you combine the real lengths of the city and the breadths of the cities, they've actually bigger than actually the, the figures day to day we read suggest. And the other thing on the contrast of that, you will find lots of areas that will just pop out of nowhere. Their Derby is a great example in Australia, which is in Tasmania, which last census had about eight people and they were, you know, one decaying pub that had more than eight, but it was about 80 or 90 people there. They've now got 500 people living there because somebody entrepreneurial put in a major dirt bike track, a tourism thing, it was sponsored, and now it's actually a booming little town. I think you'll see a handful of those come up. That doesn't mean you go and invest in them. And the key thing is don't get blinded by that activity. If you're really keen to be part of that, I think you need to look at that and, and, and investigate it. But the key thing here out of the census, I think that's important will be the major places are growing and they're bigger than, than many people think and they will continue to be the economic grunt in Australia. More people will actually be living in a, in a what I call a crowded home, um, not than a crowded home. Um, and that the more people will be renting. So as an investor, you're going to have an expanding market rather than a contracting one. Great. Um, if we're sticking on that uh, tune of, of renters, um, we have a question here from Ellie who would like to know, with changing living situations and first home buyers living with their parents longer, would you suggest they get in as investors first? Well, if you can put up living with your parents and they can put up with living with you, yes, then often if you've got a secure place to live, then the first purchase can be an invest, investment purchase to set you on your way. Often with the low interest rates where they're at, you actually are not paying much to, towards that property and the property is growing in many cases in value and I suspect in the next year or so quite sharply on it compared to historical um, average. So doing that isn't bad. In fact, I think what's happened with um, um, the home builder and the um, first home buyer grants that are from the state government towards new builds is a lot of people, have, first home buyers have taken that 
lived in that property for the mandatory time and have now gone back to either renting or living with mum and dad and now they have an investment property. I know right. that's not exactly what they were designed to do, but they did create accommodation and they are the people are being occupied. So um, it's not something that I did um, and it's not something that... Um, having spent some time with my parents of recent years living with them um, when I travel in certain parts of Brisbane. Um, it's not something I could do, but for a lot of people, um, that might be a smart thing to do is get in, get in there um, as an investor first. That's what I did <laughs> and, and what, what Matt and Al and Cam did as well. Um, Ellie, so it's, it's something that we can relate to. Uh, I think just to bring it back to some of the fundamentals that Michael talked about uh, during the, uh, the conversation today, the fact that uh, the more transient nature of work, uh, you know, at mum and dad's place, we've got my grandfather's 46 year service plate from the zinc works in Hobart, right? Uh, one, one place for nearly 50 years. Given that the uh, people are moving around, I think as a, a first home buyer demographic, let's say, you know, mid, mid 20s to early 30s, for example, uh, when you look at the numbers, it makes a lot more sense to be either ideally living at home or, or even renting and investing and holding an investment property for nothing out of your pocket on today's interest rates, uh, as opposed to necessarily buying a principal place of residence. Uh, it's a very expensive way to live when you're only going to be in that property for a relatively short period. It makes a lot of sense if you're going to be in it a long uh, time period and you get the benefit of that compound growth over several years or decades. Uh, but fundamentally, if your lifestyle situation or your family situation or your work situation is going to mean that you're not going to be in that property for, uh, for a long time, uh, then you know, rent vesting, as we call it, is something that might make sense. Jump onto our YouTube channel, uh, just put in open court rent versus own, uh, and there's a 10 or 11 minute video where I actually map out some numbers side by side. Uh, check that out and you can see the kind of difference that it makes. Thanks very much. Um, just to wrap it up, we've got a question here from Monique who would like to know, are you able to provide a long range forecast of the Australian property market? Do you think demand for housing will ease? Okay, so part of the early part of the podcast is we actually had a chart there that shows a um, 140 years. Um, and if we were to, to move that next forward, let's maybe move it 20 or 30 years, um, hopefully I'll be here that long, <laughs> that we're likely to see a, a rising demand for property, not always a rising price, as we said, there's plateaus in the market. But Australia is, um, you know, one could argue it's environmental holding capacity and a whole range of things, but Australia is in Asia, it's, it's, in a, in a, it's basically a, a place where there is a lot more growth to happen in it, particularly in housing. Um, it's an area where it's likely to grow by something in the vicinity of, um, you know, 400 to 500,000 people per year, largely driven by overseas migration. Um, and that means, you know, somewhere in the, the need to build 200 to 250 to 300 new dwellings per year, if that eventuates in terms of the, um, the, the forecast, even being conservative at 350,000 increase a year, there's need to build about 150,000 new dwellings each year. And some years we build a lot of those, other years we don't. And there is a little oversupply with the home builder at the moment, but in a year or two's time, there'll be an undersupply as well. So that keeps land values going up. And I don't think that's going to change in the major places in Australia where the economic engine rooms are, and that's um, Sydney, Melbourne, the greater um, Brisbane, South East Queensland market, and also the Perth region. Great, thanks very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thanks again for, uh, for joining us. We hope you found that uh, helpful and informative. Uh, if you have the ability, um, there's some, some pretty good news on the horizon in the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, some really important fundamentals to understand but, uh, but fundamentally, stick to, the, uh, stick to the major capital. Supply and demand, I think, is the, the main takeaway from today. And we'll, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Bye for now. Thank you very much.